Okay, so here we are for Bible study this week, and the title of our lesson is Seeing and Believing. We are entering into the Easter weekend, um, really the celebration of the resurrection, Good Friday, always is kind of a, a mixed message, Good Friday. It's good for us because we know what it means, but today we're going to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of the people who were there. Um, and kind of look at their response. We're really taking a look at the moment that several people find out that Christ is not dead in the tomb. We're literally going to put ourselves there at the moment where they see an empty tomb, um, completely expecting to visit the body of Jesus um, and to honor him that way, and they find out that he is not there. And then over the next few days, how they respond to that the interesting thing to me about this particular lesson is that each of the people we're going to look at responded differently. They're different people and they respond in different ways. And to me, that was a good thing because we're all very different people and we respond um, to this, to this very differently. But also um, these people had their lives changed forever on that day. And I think that also for us, the, as a believer, as a follower of Christ, our lives are changed forever and how we respond to the idea that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he was crucified and, and raised from the dead or resurrected um, is really of the most significance to us. So um, main idea we're going to talk about today, I'm here with my friends Sarah and Bruce and Rick, is the little phone symbol you see there, Rick Loudermelt. Can you say hi, Rick? Hey, everybody. Okay, there's a real person there. That is actually Rick. And, <laughs> Yep, and so uh, the main idea that we're gonna talk about today as we kind of just chat here with some friends, we're gonna talk about the idea, um, the lesson title is Seeing and Believing. And I it brought to mind the idea, we have the same seeing is believing, and it kind of is a different spin on that. But how did the resurrection of Jesus um, kind of force people, including us, to kind of put ourselves in a position of, you know, at one point, Jesus will say in the scripture that um, blessed are those who didn't see and believe. And that's who we are. We weren't there in person to witness this. Well, how does that affect us? And how does his resurrection give our life meaning and purpose as followers of Christ? Okay, and what's our response to that? And then I thought about, too, if seeing is believing, how can we be what people need to see? And then also as a believer or follower, um, what do we need to see to be better believers too? So those are just kind of some questions we're going to talk about as we go through the lesson. So, so how are seeing and believing related? Okay, so in context, if you have an example, maybe what's, um, can they be separated? Can you believe without seeing? And do you have an example of when that's been true for you? For most people, uh, seeing, you know, is proof of the truth of something, seeing is believing. Uh, but on the other hand, there are truths that you don't actually witness and see. So it's kind of a, it, it's, it's not as simple as it sounds. Seeing, seeing, seeing tends to confirm our beliefs, yes. but there are things that are unseen that we believe and uh, we know that they're true. Yeah. So, I think they're, tr in other words, I guess what I'm saying is, I, I think they're truths that you don't have to see, uh, literally see, right. to believe. And the, these, you know, these disciples actually witnessed, they saw the physical Jesus. Right. And uh, we, don't, we don't have that advantage uh, uh, that they had. But I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's important to know that, or to recognize that, um, there are things that are true that we don't literally see for ourselves. And we believe things like that all the time. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. I was thinking about the fact that honestly, in a way we're modeling that right now, we have Rick here on the phone and I firmly believe that is him. Mm -hmm. But I can't see him. <laughs> you can't see him. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. Um, if I saw him, I would probably feel even more comfortable that it's him, but you know, we know his voice. Um, mm -hmm. We know that he was scheduled to be here with us. So, I mean, we have that knowledge, but really seeing is a very important part. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have another example of maybe something you believe because you see it or you don't because you, you don't see it? I think that's 
the whole basis of our faith is not is believing, you know, because we can't see, but it, you know, we don't see physically, but in ways we see things every day. We see we see Jesus uh, in in ways that we can't describe. He, you know, he, he, God talks to us. Um, you know, we see we see little miracles every day. I mean, you know, you look at the birds and and the animals and the trees and I mean, you see these miracles that, that God has, has made, and, and and you see, you know, you see those things, uh, and you see things uh, that He's done. You know, in, in my life, you know, my daughter was involved in an accident, and she was in the hospital for two months, um, and you know, He brought her back from that. She, you know, she could have easily died from that. She uh, even didn't have to have her operation. They they said that there's no way she's not have to have, that, have an operation. Um, to fix her pancreas and her liver, but she ended up not even having to have the operation. And um, so that's, you know, that's something that I see that I know for a fact that God is there. Um, and, and these things that, you know, these things that we see and that happen and things all around us every day. Sure. Yeah. And I, go ahead, Sarah. I guess my hang up with just the word seeing and believing, not everyone has sight. And not every experience is seeing. So I feel like I've never seen Jesus, but I've experienced Jesus. I have felt peace that passes all understanding. Um, And I've heard the birds outside. And I, you know, there are just different ways that he um, shows himself to us. And vision, like literal vision, just isn't one of them. Yeah. And thank goodness, right? Because uh, we're going to look at a verse later where we know that he breathed the Holy Spirit onto the disciples, and he tells us clearly he leaves the Holy Spirit here with us, you know, in in place of his physical presence. But um, we don't, and for generations, no one has had the advantage of personally seeing or talking to Jesus. Um, and so, you know, being a believer does involve kind of what he says later, being blessed for believing even without seeing. So we're going to look at some of the ways some of these people reacted to when they no longer saw Jesus and how there was a little shift in the way they were thinking and how, you know, he did reaffirm and and, um, he met their fears, but he also did ultimately go away. He said, I'm going up and he did leave. um, And some of them witnessed that. But immediately after that, these faithful people began sharing you know, and they continued sharing because here we are many, many, many generations later. And honestly, we wouldn't have the, you know, the opportunity to be brought to faith like we do today if it hadn't been for those people who were faithful and shared it, whether they had seen or not. So, okay. Um, I was thinking as a teacher too, something that's interesting, you guys probably look at that. Some of you are teachers too. You know, data tells us that 50 to 70 percent of people are visual learners. In other words, they learn well by seeing something. The question in the study asked us, you know, what's something you couldn't believe if you hadn't seen it? And we mentioned while we were getting ready for our, our little study tonight, we talked about none of us would have believed that we'd be sitting home in our houses and not going to work um, at all. You know, if somebody had told me that a month ago until I saw it now, you know, I'm in it. We're all experiencing it. We wouldn't have likely um, grasped a belief of that very quickly if someone had said that's how it's going to be. Okay, so we're going to jump into the scripture part of the lesson now, Um, kind of a little to just back up and look where we're at. We are looking in John chapter 20 this um, during this lesson, and this is where we're going to see um, Jesus has been crucified at this point. Previously this week, we know that the Passover feast has just happened. There's a lot of people in Jerusalem. We know that Jesus entered very, very triumphantly. Um, Many people, many of his followers and other people had heard rumors that he was potentially, you know, kind of being slated to be the new king and that he was coming to save people. But things changed um, and turned tragic very quickly. What it would have felt like just a few days later, um, just how sad it would have been right, that he's all of a sudden gone, taken from you quickly and tragically, and people clearly loved him. He had good friends, Um, but also disappointing. I feel like it would have been very disappointing just in those first few days, first few hours witnessing his crucifixion. Um, What might be some of the thoughts that were running through their heads? 
Well, I think, I think disappointment, like you mentioned, Sean, that uh, the people who had followed Christ and believed him and heard him and witnessed him must have thought that, uh, that it was, that it was, uh, none of it was true. Yeah. That, that, uh, he was, he was a man and then he was executed and he was gone forever. I mean, that, I, I would imagine that would have been the feeling on, a, on, a, on the part of a lot of people. Yeah. A disappointment. Yes. Yeah, I think so too. What else? I think about Mary, his mom, a lot. Like, she watched him. Like, she, she knew who Jesus was, but she taught him his first words, watched him learn how to walk. Um, and saw his whole ministry from the very, very beginning and knew what was coming, but still had to experience it and to like see him on the cross and think about when she held him for the first time, just how incredibly awful that would have been as his mother. Yeah, very painful. Yeah, absolutely. I also just kept thinking, um, beyond disappointment just kind of shock to and and kind of like bruce mentioned um questioning like wait a minute i thought this was going to turn out differently and mm -hmm. any of these people knew that he had raised lazarus from the dead um and i'm wondering you know how how did that add up in their minds okay wait a minute he had the power to bring this merely human guy back to life you know how in the world if he's really you know god's son is he not able how, how could he be killed you know almost like he should be immortal in a way anybody yeah. else well it didn't That's i mean jesus jesus told his disciples that he was going to die right and yes. that he was going to be executed in in, in effect and yes. they never seemed to understand that I, which i guess that would be a hard thing to understand of the son of god to say that well i'm gonna i've got to die yeah uh, that, 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 I mean, what kind of, what kind of God, I guess, is that? Right. I don't think they were expecting God to come in that form. Right. Yeah. I think, I think a little confusion too, you know, they, in that sense, they, they thought this was going to be their king, you know, the, and a different yeah. kind of king, you know, yeah. they conquer, conquer their enemies and, 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 you know, lead them that way. And then all of a sudden he's gone and, you know, they think, well, I guess that's it, you know? Yeah. So I guess a little confusion on their part too, you know, shock and disappointment and confusion. That's what I thought too, because all these people had, some of them had devoted several years of their lives now to this ministry and to following him. And then he's gone, um, literally gone yeah. and at the hands of, um, you know, a, a government, a government took him away, a, a powerful entity, and they probably felt helpless and powerless. You know, who am I to, to fight the Roman government or any, you know, any um, large entity when sometimes you guys know how it feels, how can one person make a difference? And also I think they were fearful. We know that um, poor Peter denied him several times and a lot of them struggled just during the process of Jesus being put to death. Um, they kind of scattered and disappeared. We're kind of led to think that and probably out of fear for their own lives, you know, because yeah. they were yeah. They could be next. Yeah. And I think that would be, you know, terribly frightening. And mm -hmm. also, if you don't have a leg to stand on, then it's kind of, he's gone now. So now what do you do? Yeah. So, um, but then to think that he actually was not dead would be a polar shift in their thinking. And so um, that's pretty exciting. Um, now he's been um, crucified. They are all in this state of mourning and shock. And so Sarah, would you read um, John chapter 20? We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Okay. So Mary, in her grief and in her love, right, for Jesus and her wishing to still honor him even in death, gets up early. Um, I can imagine any number of people I know, you know, after a loved one has gone, visiting the grave is still something we do today, right? 
clearly it was a huge big stone and it's moved and she can look inside and see that the tomb is empty. And I'm imagining, you know, that she immediately thinks, oh no, you know, these people, haven't they had enough? They even, you know, they're so horrible. They even came and stole his body. They're not even going to let us have that pleasure, you know, or maybe that grave robbers had come or Jewish authority had hidden his body so he couldn't be further worshipped in any way, right? She's got all these thoughts running through her mind. Can you at all imagine that her first thought would have been, oh, it's empty because he got up and he's out hanging around somewhere. Yeah, I, <laughs> that would have been a first thought, apparently. Yeah, and I just can't yeah. even, yeah. right? How, right, so her thought is what she, first thought, it's he's gone, so she can't do what she came <laughs> to do, and so she runs back and she tells, for sure, Peter, and another disciple that it's empty. The one Jesus loved. Yes, the one Jesus loved, that, that he's gone. And so when I think about that, you know, their, their, their response is very interesting. What do they do in response to that? They take off and go look for themselves. So this is our first case of seeing is believing, right? She told them he's gone. Yeah. They but, couldn't believe it. Yeah. They, they, couldn't, couldn't, they had to see it for themselves. Exactly. And I thought that would probably be my first instinct too. Like, no way, you got to be kidding me. Oh, yeah, of course. Yep. So we know that the next thing that happens, um, according to scripture, is that they, they exactly do that. They take off and they run quickly to see for themselves. And sure enough, when they get there, we're even told Peter, we know that he was probably a brash kind of guy. He, he pops in there and he looks in the tomb and sure enough, it's, it's empty. Um, we're told just the burial cloths remain um and we're even we're even told by scripture that peter is still a little stumped um but it says that the other disciple immediately saw it and he did come to the conclusion that um the belief that jesus had probably indeed risen from the dead um but then we're also told in the next few verses that they they returned to their homes and probably just trying to process it all they're probably like mary magdalene running all the scenarios through their head um and also figuring out what to do next right it's a mystery um can you imagine if that was you what would you look back on so far if you discovered if let's say we were one of the disciples and we get there um i can't imagine myself thinking back to all the things he's ever said to me okay what did he say to me um what are some of the things you might have been thinking if you had discovered the empty tomb I probably thought I wasn't a very good listener. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, uh, you wonder, I mean, you know, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty, but you wonder, you know, were they not paying attention? I mean, were they not listening? I, I don't, it's just kind of hard to think back, you know, what what was on their minds, how they were interpreting this. I, hard to uh, And just what do you do? What do you do next? How do you respond to that? And so we're going to look and see kind of what happens next, because Jesus doesn't make them wait long, which is probably a good thing, right? So, um, Rick, will you read John chapter 20? These are verses 11 through 18. Sure. Okay. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she left, she stopped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken my, away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabbi, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord, and she gave them his message. Okay, this makes me smile so big. I can't read that without getting the hugest smile because 
as much as their grief must have been huge, um, that instant where Jesus calls her by name must have been so powerful. Um, I can't imagine. She instantly, it says, she instantly turns toward him and says, teacher, right? Um, she knows immediately that it's him. I have to feel like that is so shocking. Um, not only is he alive, which explains why the tomb was empty, but he's there speaking to her. I'm assuming his voice was recognizable. I don't know, but I'm assuming he sounded like himself. Um, and he's there in person. That to me is just beyond um, imagination. I try to put myself like, how would that feel? Uh, and she's so excited. She's overjoyed. And then she does an instinctively what I think a lot of us would have done. What does she do right away? After she realizes she who thinks, it is. Yeah, she thinks that, that he's the gardener or someone has taken the body yeah. away. What? Yeah. Wait, wait, what? Are, and, then, and then when he says her name, she knows it's him. And what does she want to do? Touch him. Yeah, she wants to cling to him. She wants to grab him and hug him. Yeah. Yes, she wants to touch him. Now, I have to wonder how in this previous few hours, okay, so when she went back and told the disciples that the tomb was empty, and it, it says to us that one of the disciples immediately figured out, or he believed. It says, the, my, my translation says he believed. I have to think maybe they talked about it, maybe on the way home. They're all there together. Maybe somebody said, you know, guys, he did talk about this. Maybe, maybe he is alive. So, but the instant she knows it for a fact, I have to believe was just so powerful. Um, she sees him, she wants to touch him. And he says, okay, um, you can't touch me yet. But he says, go tell my brothers, go tell the others about it. Um, how many times, I, I didn't look it up, but I'm sure there's an answer for this somewhere in the interwebs of the world. But how many times do you think Jesus says, go and tell? Mm. A lot, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in, this, in this case too, I mean, it doesn't, the verses here don't say that Mary, that uh, Mary Magdalene had a lot to say, which I think is perfectly natural. What what would she say at this point? She was probably she was probably dumbfounded and amazed. And yes. you know, Jesus does the talking. He says, "Go, you know, go tell the others." Yep. Uh, and yep. that that seems to me would be how uh, most people would react when faced with uh, the resurrected Jesus. Yes, absolutely. What do you say? You'd be speechless. Absolutely, speechless. And so he gives her, he helps her out, and he gives her a clear directive. Go and tell my brothers. And he specifically says, I'm returning to my father and my God, um, your father and your God. Right? He, he states that very plainly to them. And she does, and she says, she tells them, I have seen the Lord. That's her words when she gets back and she tells the others this. And so this kind of goes back to our earlier question, how does the resurrection of Jesus give us a meaning and a purpose? So what is Mary's meaning and purpose right here? What has he instructed her to do? Spread the message that he's risen. Absolutely. And how does that kind of translate for us today, really? If this is where the story ended, and it doesn't, but if this is where the episode ended, what kind of message can we take away from this? You know, how does the resurrection affect us as a believer or a follower of Christ? It's the most important fact in Jesus's ministry. The fact that he did in fact do what he's, well, he did prove he was who he said he was. Absolutely. And uh, I think, does it, is it uh, Paul who says later on that uh, if Jesus didn't, uh, if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, then yes. our faith is in vain. Absolutely. Right. That's right. So, you know, his, his ministry would have been, had this event not occurred. So it was, right. it astounded, you know, everybody that, that was, was aware of it. Yep. And I had to think, so when Mary is excited, he tells her, go and tell them, you know, how do, how do you guys talk? How do I talk? How do people talk when you want to be convincing? What are some of the ways we share a message if we want to be convincing? If we want to tell somebody something we really believe in, kind of. Well, maybe with some emotion, I you would, might you might raise your voice. Uh, yes. 
you wouldn't maybe be speaking in a normal tone. You might, you, you know, you speak excitement in your voice or some conviction. Yep. You probably see it on your face too. If you're, I mean, yep. if you're there in person telling someone, I mean, you probably see the excitement and the enthusiasm on their faces and, and their body language. Right. Oh, great. Uh, here's another flip side of that. How do people know you're telling the truth? That's a tougher one. That's a tougher one. Yeah. Going and looking. Okay. <laughs> yes, we've already seen that, right? So kind of want to know it for themselves. Some of them have seen the empty tomb at this point. Um, they know that his body is gone. Some of them have an inkling right? That maybe something really special has occurred. Mary witnesses it firsthand. She gets a firsthand account. She knows for a fact now in her mind um, that Jesus Christ has definitely conquered death. She goes and tells people. And so I have to wonder about the conversations that took place over the next few hours. Um, because in the next scripture that I'm going to have Bruce read, we know that Jesus does finally appear to the to the disciples but you know when she went and told them i i'm trying to envision what that looked like um she was probably really excited i'm guessing she was speechless like bruce said when she was there but i bet she had a lot to say when she was trying to convince them of what she just saw okay so let's look at these last few verses this is john chapter um 20 but verses 19 and 20. on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Okay. Again, a big smile, right? I can imagine. First of all, it specifically takes the time John relates to us that the doors were locked. And it uses the word Jesus appeared. I looked at a couple other translations. It said materialized. He appeared. Um, he was just there, suddenly there. Mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. That is mind boggling to me. I mean, I'm thinking about my little office or wherever you all are. You know, if Jesus just appeared um, in person. I like Star Trek. Yeah, right. <laughs> Beamed in, right? Yeah. Um, right. Can you imagine, and again, we're going back to the idea of seeing is believing. They already maybe thought of it. Mary had told them. They're reflecting on all their past conversations and teachings of Jesus. And then there he is, for real. No doubt they've been talking about it, but they hear his voice. He speaks, shows them his wounds. You just read that. And he's there. And it says they were overjoyed when they saw him. And I have to think about, you know, and Sarah alluded to the fact that some people can't see too, right? And how do you know? But there's just that physical presence, you know, a person, their clothing makes noise, right? Um, that you might be able to smell them. You might be able to hear their feet, their footsteps. There's just a physical presence sense when someone is near you. And, you know, the fact that he was there with them, it says they were overjoyed. Uh, the scripture also tells us that he... Um, in the next verse, in John 20, 21, something very important happens, and it says, he breathes the Holy Spirit onto them, and he tells them, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And we're going to see Jesus culminate his ministry. We know that also after this, a little later, um, Thomas, who has missed this first encounter, is there again at another time shortly down the road and he gets a chance to touch Jesus and see that he's real. Um, and at that point, the scripture tells us that Jesus says to him, um, because you have seen, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So as we kind of wrap up our lesson for tonight, um, there's a lot going on here, but I think about all the ways that we are told, even in just this appearance, you know, Jesus Christ has been crucified, then he's resurrected, and he's still instructing his followers, the people who are believing him, to do what? What is something he has said in every instance we've just looked at? To, to testify to his presence. Yes. And, yeah. It's not a physical presence for us either, you know, going back to the initial question. Yeah. Seeing is believing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Seeing and believing. And so it kind of makes me want to wrap up here with the idea we talked about. Um, how does Jesus's resurrection, first of all, this Easter that we're celebrating, um, how does that give us as a follower of Christ a meaning and a purpose? How can we be and help be what people need to see, to believe? What are some of the things that you guys think of? What, what does that bring to mind? Well, we could live a life that, as, you know, as Jesus wants to live. Um, we can witness to others. We can love each other. We can um, give back. Um, you know, we just show show Jesus love through uh, through ourselves. Yeah. And I keep thinking about those verses of Mary, you know, running back and saying it excitedly, um, you know, and having passion when we do it and, and being committed and excited about sharing it. Not that you have to yell it in someone's face or jump up and down, but just being, you know, full of that, that conviction and that excitement of knowing um, that that is truly what has happened and wanting to share it. Um, how... Anybody else? Yeah. How can we be what people need to see? We, we don't have the advantage that, the, in a sense, the disciples had of seeing, see, actually seeing Jesus after right. his death. So the only way to, one of the ways, I guess, to convince others is to, as uh, Rick said, live the kind of lives that would uh, model Jesus in a way. And I mean, that, that's, some, that's uh, somewhat of a testament to his his uh, his life and his continued life is to for us to live as if you know he was living in us. Yes, yes. And last week, some of the scripture we looked at in the chapter previous, he basically said, "If you want to be close to the Father, stay close to me. Right, be in the light, walk walk the walk I am walking." And so, as he's just said here, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And I think that's a powerful thing for us. And then just also to think about. You know, as a believer, if seeing is believing, um, you know, some of the things, how can we see better or what can we make sure we're looking at in order to be even better followers? Um, that for me was kind of an even tougher question, but a good one. You know, what do we need to be looking at? How can we see um, to believe? Well, just, you know, we just want to, want to build on that relationship with God. Um, like you said, through scripture reading, uh, through church services, uh, through through singing hymns, um, through prayer, uh, you know, through our work uh, with others, um, you know, just building that relationship with Him and, and doing it on a regular basis. And I've noticed that, you know, when I when I don't when I let that relationship kind of uh, go go aside, that you know, it's I, I easily forget, and you know. I, simple things that I forget. So it's important to do, you know, daily uh, devotionals and, and just to build on a relationship, you know, as, as frequently as you can to, to reinforce those teachings to you. Well, I think one thing you said, Sean, about what do we need to see, you know, uh, if we believe, and I think I would just add, we need to see, try to see the best in others that you were saying Jesus, you know, died for everyone. And so, it's probably incumbent on us if we are faithful to our to our Christian beliefs that we try to we try to see you know the best in others and the Christ in others and that sometimes that's hard sometimes that's hard to do. Yep, I think that's a great point. True. And Sarah, did you have something you wanted to say? I think the hope of the resurrection, like what makes it so meaningful that he died and then there's easter he rose again it's just that he overcame darkness and death um and so we have that hope that he is in us so we are overcomers we can be life and light to the people around us through his work in us right well said yeah I, I love that. Thank you. And thanks everybody for sharing and being here tonight. Um, I know we all had some busy days and we had a lot going on. I appreciate you guys. Father, just thank you for each person that has shared together, Lord, in this 
um, this way, even though we're not physically together, Lord, we know that you've provided this way for us to communicate and to still, Lord, um, just be able to have you with us. We know that you told us that wherever several are gathered in your name, God, that you are there with us. And even through the digital conversation, God, you are with us and just sharing your word and your, um, just your precious gift of Jesus Christ. And thank you for that gift. Thank you for Easter time and the, the beautifulness of the resurrection and all that it means to us as believers. Help us to go and tell and help us to follow that call to be sent just as Jesus was sent. Um, I just thank you for the Holy Spirit and all that you give us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean.